Welcome back. Hello. How are you? I'm going well. That's good. I could barely see you. You half disappeared on the couch. <laughs> You've lost all this weight. All this weight. Not not so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I've been talking about this guy a little bit, a long time. We've had a few false starts to get him on. Mainly he has an aversion to technology like myself, I think. And the thought of getting on Zoom and doing it was just not going to not gonna fly. Yep. Um, the man himself is Danny Fegan. Now, had you heard of him before I sort of started going on about it? Yeah, I actually, in my previous job, I used to have to read reports yeah, on okay. how the entertainment went at one of the clubs around here, and he was always getting superstar reviews. Superstar. And I did catch a, one of his sets during a country music festival one day, and I thought, wow, he's pretty good. Well, the thing I like about him, I never liked country music. Yeah, well, I still don't really. <laughs> and until, to be honest, until I sort of, and this is just goes back to, to me, like liking people and then getting to appreciate what they do as a craft mm. as opposed to liking the music or the craft first and then, yeah. Yep. But he's just a, a really cool guy. He's a nice guy too. And he seems to be genuinely just cares about stuff and cares about people and I got around his music because of those traits. He's very generous. Yeah, I know as a performer I thought that oh, he has to be from Tamworth or even from the city Yeah, because they were very polished mm-hmm. and the whole thing was like, oh, well, they're as good as any country band I've seen. I mean, I'm not massively into the genre, but being a guitar player. Yeah. I can recognise, well, he's a great singer, performer, the guitaring, all the instrumentation's great. Yeah. And then I find out he's from 20 Ks down the road. I know. <laughs> so. I know. We get to go and have a little bit of a visit there. I'm excited about the getting out of town, although it won't be very far. Just, I, I remember when you first came on the show, I always wanted for us to be out and about a little bit, going yep. going to certain people. Mm-hmm. I think you put up the idea of Canada at one point. That seems a bit far-fetched <laughs> at the moment, but I mean, if we get 20 k's out of town, mate, that's Canberra's a start. a bit far-fetched at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to get him on, hear a bit of his story, hopefully a different side, because um, he's quite chatty, but I know there's a lot of depth in there as well, so I'd like to sort of extrapolate some of that. I'm just keen to have a look around his farm and meet a cool guy. Yeah. This is Danny Fegan. Get around him. Welcome to Punching Sideways, Mr. Danny Fegan, or you've welcomed us into your amazing property today. Thanks for having us. Not talking now. You're not talking? You push the red button. (laughs) The red button. (laughs) Red light fever. We've had all that chats over the last 45 minutes. (laughs) We have. I feel like there's no more questions to ask. But we're sitting here right now. There's horses to the left. There's cattle yards that you've built. Drinkers to the right. Yeah, I was going to pull that (laughs) joke, but I thought I'd just leave that one for you. (laughs) We've seen your homestead. I've met someone I know. There's so much history in this property. Can you first of all just tell us... Because Josh was asking us, asking me on the way here, what does Danny class himself as? Don't know. And yep. that would probably <laughs> be the best question for you to answer. I'm a singing farmer and hopefully at the end of each year I've got something to sing about. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's probably it in a nutshell. I don't know. I've had a stab at a lot of things, but um, we've always been farming. Like even yep. when we had the office in town, I was third generation pub broker in real estate in town, but we still, we're always farming and I... I stayed in town long enough that Caroline and I could pay this place down to somewhere where it was comfortable just to come back out here and stay here. Mm-hmm. And I reckon that was about 2015 or 16. We had a pretty busy year. We were running the Drodgery Pub. Um, this place is 2,500 acres, so it takes a fair bit of running, um, although we share farm the cropping site with Caroline's two brothers. Uh, music was busy. I was all over the place on weekends. Five kids doing sport. Six kids now, but five kids at the time doing sport. Uh, and trying to run the office as well, so yeah, it was a it was a big period. So after the end of that, I um I sort of had a look at the mortgage and I thought I reckon I can stay. So we shut the door after three generations down in town. Yeah, right. So this place you've acquired this, you chose this place, and this is you've started from scratch. Well, yeah, but it was by default. Yeah. Um, because years ago I did a, uh, a horse ride for cancer research. We rode from Darwin down the bottom of Tassie. It was called Campfires Against Cancer. 
And in the course of that ride, we camped on a place called King River Station, south of Catherine, between Catherine and Mataranga. Mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to go to the Territory. Still do. And Caroline uh, uh, was working all over the place. She, Caroline's a sonographer and a radiographer, so she was working all around Australia as temp work, getting flying, all, like flying about all over the place. And anyway, when we finished that ride, um, King River came on the market. And I sort of got to know the bloke and we camped on the place and everything. He was a bit of an eccentric old fella and the more interest we showed in it, he just kept jacking the price up. Yeah. And I had uh, a couple of country pub freeholds at the time and Caroline had paid a house off in town. Uh, so we had enough to sell to get a deposit together. And uh, we put our best foot forward with King River. We offered him his asking price, but then he kept sort of jacking the price up over three and four months. And yeah. In the end, actually, uh, he sold the, the the property for exactly what we offered him six months later through an agent. Um, <laughs> so we, we could well have been Territorians all this time. Yeah. And we came back home here. Um, Kaz and I had been together nearly 10 years before I did the ride. We got together at school. And as um, soon as the ride finished, I went up to pick her up in Townsville. We got engaged straight away. We were married six months later and Jess was on the ground nine months after that. So we, we had a plan to get a place. This place came on the market. This is two and a half thousand acres now. The original holding was 1,313 acres, yeah, which we couldn't afford. And we were looking around everywhere and we were bridesmaids at all these auctions. <laughs> and I felt we were pushing the price up everywhere. You know, it was that 02, 03 boom yeah. um, into 04. Yeah. And um, we were just trying to find our own patch. You know, the first one was 300 acres down near Drodgery West down there. Then we looked at 500 at Tabletop and... We kept going back to the bank looking for more money and looking for more acres and I felt all we were doing was pushing the price up. Yeah. This place fell through the cracks because it's generally considered a pretty wet farm for cropping, which suited us for cattle. And I guess the people who owned it were conditioned already due to a failed auction for us to come and talk to them. And this place wasn't on the radar. We didn't think we could afford it. Yeah. But we bought that initial holding in two halves. We bought uh, 700 acres with the home on it. And we leased the other 613 or whatever it was for five years with an option to buy. And in that five years, this is a long answer, isn't it? No, it's <laughs> I tended, good. I tend it's to good. do this. I'll take up your time. No, no, this is a good. long show. Yeah, so. a long in a minute, show. I'm going to read the phone book to you. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we leased the other half of the country for five years. And in that time, I um, I got a bit lucky with some uh, some country in town. We owned 15 acres in Kerr's Road, which got rezoned resi- residential. Yeah. So we sold that as a residential housing lot. And that set us up to buy... 400 acres on the corner, which came up, and then my mate's place, 600 acres down here, which squared us off nicely. And the last parcel we took up was the bit that we leased nearly five years on the day, and that got us to nearly nearly 2,500 acres, and that's that's where we sit. We've been here 16 years, so mm-hmm. whatever the count back is. The, a quick progression. I know that probably people would hear 16 years and think that that's not but really to to get to that point where you've acquired all this land and it's not inherited is a pretty big undertaking. So well done for that. Yeah, look, I, I think it was just the timing was okay. Caroline had done well. She, she'd paid off a house in two or three years. She doesn't drink. She doesn't go out. She, yeah. she does all the good things that I don't do, and that was a big help. But I think the timing was right. I don't know how kids can get into farming now with the way um, broadacre prices have gone. Oh. Jess, you got to look at the price of places in Meta at the moment. Oh, yeah. Going, it's ridiculous. I definitely will never probably be a, a farmer, I'd say, unless I marry one. Well, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, I've got six kids. They'd all love to get into farming, and 2,500 acres sounds like a big spread, but, it, um, you know, six doesn't go into it to make a lot to make a uh, career out of it. No. They're lifestyle blocks, and if I went – to the bank now to borrow money to buy this place now with what they value rural acreage at, I don't know how I'd pay it off just yeah. with farming. Yeah. I sort of think now you can't really just be a farmer unless you've got that amount of acreage that you can sort of, you sort of, it turns into a big business. Yeah. As opposed to, I know the people that bought my parents' place just basically turned it into a feedlot for dairy farm just pumping the yep. the stuff through so it's a bit of a tricky one but tell so from farming and you've got this beautiful place and you mentioned this cancer ride which I'm really interested about can you tell us how that came about uh, it was a long time ago now it's 20 years actually next yep. year um and incidentally I was going to ride from Perth to Sydney next year campfires two in 2022 but I don't know if COVID's going to sort of ruin all that or not. I'd love to support the regional cancer centre down here with another big push. Yeah. The first one came about my grandfather 
uh, Herb Freer. He was a uh, he trained for the Light Horse for World War Two. Uh, he was a drover. He was a stock buyer for fifty two years. I spent a lot of time with him uh, while Dad was trying to get on his feet because the Fegans came to town with nothing. They were one of nine. Dad was one of nine kids. Uh, they. I was born in Sydney, moved to Golgong, um, and then down to Albury. Pa was running a pawn shop in Mate Street, selling second-hand washing machines and things. Oh, and different type of pawn. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. What time not, is this going not, to Not a yeah. drone street <laughs> pawn shop. <laughs> yeah. just, that's all right. Sorry, just thought I'd clarify. I saw your car park there. <laughs> or you just run across yeah. the Bunnings. Yeah, just the Bunnings. Just going to Bunnings. <laughs> What time slots is it ring out? I could go <laughs> any, anywhere with this. Any, you could go any. Yeah. Um, so your dad was running a pawn shop. No, no, pa was. And pa was running yeah. a pawn shop. And a bloke came in who uh, he knew had a real estate license. So he asked if he could try and sell some real estate under this bloke's license, his yep. banner. And that's what set so the Fegans up in real estate. And that's where it all started. So dad was trying to get on his feet and he was working flat out. So I was with my grandfather five or six days out of seven, right up till I was about 15 or 16. So we were very good mates, and he taught me how to ride and do all those things, which I enjoy now. He would have loved this place, by the way. And uh, he died of cancer, which knocked me around a bit at that age. Um, and I always want to do something to try and contribute to it, because it, uh, as much as anything, I've always been grateful for the life that I've got. So I decided to ride from Darwin to Coryong originally, and I was working in – I don't know how far back to go with this, but I was working in real estate at the time – which was a hangover of failing at law. I did three and a half years in law and um, sort of got the shits with it and the study and everything and had a blue with Dad. So I jumped on a plane and went to America and I was breaking in horses and taking trail rides through the Rocky Mountains uh, in 98. And and Dad conned me, I reckon. I, I was talking to him and uh, he said, I reckon you're old enough to go into the family business now into real estate. I think I was 22. And uh, so I flew home under the assumption that I was going to start with real estate and uh dad said i never said that get back and finish your law so <laughs> so i went and got a job with his brother john fegan and um cut my teeth with him for a couple of years and in the process of doing that we're at a seminar in sydney and i was talking to a mate Ian james so i said i'm going to plan this ride i'm going to ride from darwin down to Coryong, and i'm going to try and raise half a million dollars for cancer research and he jumped on board and helped me organize it he just lost his mate to bowel cancer at only 31 or two and that's how it all sort of started you know and um there was three years in the planning. We were the highlight event of the year of the Outback, 2002. We staggered into 2003 as well. We are on the road 11 months. Far out. And uh, when we got to Coryong, my, uh, my best mate, like Cole Mitchell, rode with us, Colin Mitchell from Corowa. He was sort of like a father figure, a brother, a mentor and everything. You know, Cole was 20 years older than me, but he was, he was my best mate. We rode together the whole way. And I said, geez, mate, I can't imagine if I'm ever going to ride from Darwin to Coryong again. It'd be... A, shame to waste this opportunity let's keep going so we saddled up and rode down to melbourne we didn't have any permits to ride through <laughs> melbourne so we just hooked in yeah ask, ask for forgiveness absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's was it it's easy to ask for, for forgiveness and yeah. permission as well yeah so yeah we we um we tore off down that way and we found pretty quickly that the easiest way to get down to melbourne is actually on the freeway although we weren't meant to be there we just uh, were cantering down that middle island <laughs> And the cars are zinging past so quick either way, no one saw us. Because it was just, we kept getting in dead enders trying to follow the old tracks down to Melbourne. Like yep. We were dropping fences and straining them back up and... <laughs> Hang on. Is it, are you picking that up? Bit of ambience. Sorry. Yeah, they're just... I, I they're think s- that everyone realises we're outside, yeah, we're outside at the moment. So Yeah, yeah those little <laughs> yeah. fellas are just spraying the wheat for rust at the moment. It's a little bit wet to get the tractors over some of this country. <laughs> <laughs> Never stops the farming, does it? No, oh, this place is like Burke Street out here. Yeah. It's always someone coming and going. <laughs> yeah. oh, I forget where we got up to, Mel. Uh, well, we yeah. got up to trying to get through Josh. Burke Street on a all, Oh, a horse, that's I'm right. Assuming. Yeah, so we got down there and we hooked in um, past the markets, St Kilda Markets, and we got down to St Kilda, the Spirit of Tasmania. And by the time we got there, oh, there was there was these big riot, uh, not riots, big um, protests on the G2 summit or something was in Melbourne. And um, so the cops were pretty well, had their hands full with all that sort of caper yeah. going on. Like, and it wasn't like we were robbing banks or anything, but we were meant to have permits to ride livestock down through the yep. through the middle, and we didn't have them because we didn't know we were going there. Anyhow, we hooked in. We got down to St Kilda Beach down there to get on that big boat, and um, when we got down there, we had two cops, uh, the Melbourne Age, the Sun Herald, and a car full of security guards 
or trying to stop us, but it was too late. We're already on the beach. <laughs> so they just came and questioned us what we're doing. And once we told them what we're doing, they just slapped us on the back. So good on you. Yeah. So we loaded nine horses on the Spirit of Tasmania. Never been to Tasmania before in my life. Uh, and I looked at the map and it was starting to get into um, late autumn, like May, you know, starting to get pretty cold. So I looked at the map and I thought, oh, well, the quickest point, quickest way between two points is a straight line. We'll just go, you know, straight down there through Harbour and get down the bottom. And I didn't realise that was going to take us up over the highest alpine regions of the state. Like two or three nights later, it was freezing. Yeah, <laughs> Minus cold, four or five degrees up at the yeah. Great Lakes. And Danny, can we just go back a sec? You just said you took nine horses mm-hmm. on the Spirit of Tasmania. Horses aren't known as being the most calm of animals, <laughs> and that's not known as being a very calm piece of water. So what can you just talk us through maybe a few moments of that trip with a couple of horses? Do you like coffee? Yes, I do like coffee. Do you know how we could make each other really happy? If you got on to punchingsideways.com and hit the buy me a coffee button and hooked me up with some caffeine. That would be great. Can you just talk us through maybe a few moments of that trip with a couple of horses? It was fairly non-eventful, actually. The the horses were terrifically calm after 11 months on the road or 10 months at that stage. Okay, They were bomb-proof, but you've got to load them onto a truck. You can't just hitch him to the rail there at the yeah, that's program shed. I'm just thinking about the audience might be thinking, so they were just hanging out on the... <laughs> yeah, 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 out on the balustrade. Yeah, out there. on the balustrade. Yeah, yeah a bit of nine-pound line out. Yeah. No, you, Trying to have a cocktail in the pool and there's two <laughs> horses with you. Well, that's what we thought we were going to do. We loaded the horses up on the truck and um, they had to do the whole journey over. They think it's a 12-hour trip from memory. I'd heard stories that there was a casino on this thing and um, live music and a bar and... <laughs> I thought, oh, this is the blowout we need, you know, after 10 months on the road. Well, the casino, I think, was two poker machines, which I don't play anyway, and there was no live music. There was a bit of ambient elevator stuff sort of going on. The bar shut at 10 (laughs) o'clock, which is just as well because I get horribly seasick, and apparently my mates who went that far with me do too. (laughs) Um, The captain gave us a room, which was nice of him. So we had four bunks. There was five of us, I think. Luke was my mate. It was my opal mining partner. He was uh, sleeping on the floor. But we were as crook as dogs before we even left the bay. And uh, there were two-metre swells. I don't know if that's big or little, but it, it felt big. Um, <laughs> just sort of laying on the bed, you're banging your head, then you're hitting your feet and banging your head. It was brutal. Yeah. yeah. But we, uh, the, there was a, uh, the eventful part of it was that we wanted to check the horses. Um, we got up and pulled ourselves together because we just wanted to make sure they're okay. And we thought they'd be freezing cold. So we had rugs on, they had the window shut in the truck. And I don't know if you heard about the polar cross horses that died a few years ago on the Spirit of Tasmania. No. I can understand how that would happen because we, we, we totally got it wrong. We thought they'd be freezing. We're trying to look after them. And we told the security guard, we asked the security guard, we'd like to get down there. And he said no. And then we told him we we're going down there one way or the other yeah. to check them. So he had to go and get the captain to come down and the captain met, met us. And we said, look, we'll only be 15 minutes. I understand it's a security yeah. issue, but we need to check the horses. Yeah. So he escorted us down there. And the trucks were jammed so tight together in the cars, you couldn't get the any of the doors open. And I was skinny enough that we could just get the gate at the back open a couple of feet and Cole jimmied me up and I basically did a Superman down the other side <laughs> and, and ended up under the horse's legs sort oh, of Jesus. thing um, <laughs> to get in there. Uh, I was small enough to be able to do that, but it was just as well we checked them because they were dying of heat. They, they or not literally dying, they would have, I think, yeah. but there was probably two inches of sweat at the bottom of the truck already. Uh, everything was fogged up and they, oh, they weren't no. in a great way, so... I had to slip underneath them, and they were so quiet. They were were beautiful horses. I had to crawl in between their legs and undo all their rug uh, clips and everything and drag their rugs off and open the windows up, and um, they were fine. But it knocked the stuffing out of them a bit. We pulled up at Devonport the next day. We rode off. I got the truck off, um, and then we rode them out of the truck and kept riding to the showgrounds. And we could sell. They were a bit tired, so we just let them loose at the showgrounds there, expecting to give them a break for a few hours and maybe ride out. And they all just laid down flat in the sun and just went to sleep. Right. Yeah, and for a prey animal, you know, that's that's they've got to be fairly comfortable normal with the normally with their environment to yeah. do that. And they weren't comfortable with that environment. They'd never been there before, so they were exhausted. Yeah. But it looked like a good idea, so we did the same thing. <laughs> Sounds like and then two days later you're in the coldest place oh, in Tasmania. It was bloody brutal. They were right, they were all rugged up and everything, but we were freezing. Yeah. Absolutely freezing. Yeah. 
And I got a bit of a crook back too. I'd um, I'd had a rodeo fall three months prior to that in Gundawindi in in the saddle bronc at Gundawindi, and I hadn't got my back checked out, but I knew something had gone wrong because I was an inch and a half shorter than I was. No, I don't know. <laughs> it's something was wrong there. So you know that cold coupled with being in the saddle for nearly eleven months and freezing cold up there. It, I don't know. Photos always look nicer than the moment. Yeah, but. <laughs> Well, that was a big story. But yeah, yeah, it was. was a, I don't think I feel like I haven't drawn breath yet. No, no, because I've heard a lot about that, and I know you did and do have a, you know, a draw to raising money for cancer and everything like this. Now, we don't have to leave this bit in, but I do know the solar farms that that's happening. Oh, I'm happy to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about your acquisition I suppose of doing some solar farming and maybe a little bit of the resistance but your motivation behind it yeah well thanks for asking the question firstly because um, obviously it's been a subject of discontent for some who missed out on the opportunity yep. um, over the last three or four years and all variety of media have reported their side of it no one's ever asked me to speak about it until now yeah the long and the short of it Mel is we, we uh, didn't try to acquire it at all they came to us uh, there's power lines, you can't see them from here, but across the road on the neighbour's property, there's quite big power lines which apparently can carry a huge volume of power. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm no electrician. I don't try and invest any energy in understanding it. My take on it's always been we're not building a solar farm, we're only leasing some of our paddocks to yeah. a company which we're entitled to do. I think a fair-minded person would understand we're not greedy people. It was a commercial opportunity which fell in our lap essentially. Yeah. It looks like it's going to go ahead now. It's on very low-lying country down here, which is well-suited to it and well-suited to grazing, and we can still graze sheep underneath the panels. Now, we've had a long track record of giving it away, money, I mean, and supporting causes even before we had money. And if this goes ahead, obviously our kids are going to be okay, and it's a lucrative deal. But that only increases our capacity to further invest in causes we've spent a lifetime supporting anyway. And I'd never said this before because I didn't want it to look like I was trying to buy favour because for a long while, like, we were on the stink, you know, out here. Yeah. Which is really disappointing because we've helped a lot of people, which I'd never name. Yeah. But when you walk down the street and they look over their shoulder to see if it's okay to say good day to you if anyone's watching. Yeah. You know, it really is on the nose. Yeah. Um, but I'd always thought, I mean, we're going okay. We've worked hard. We still work hard. We're going okay. We're very lucky for this to fall in our lap. But as I say, it only increases our capacity to to further invest in causes that we've supported anyway, not just because we can now. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that if this goes ahead, I'd love to perpetually support the Regional Cancer Centre in Albury. And I guess I can say that now, um, that I've been speaking with them. We're we're discussing uh, the research fellowships or to get more oncology nurses or something to Albury. Having said that, though, it's it's not a it's not guaranteed it's going to go ahead yet either. It has been approved. It looks like it's going to go ahead, but COVID has slowed a lot of things down, and you just never know until it actually happens. You never know. At best, it's going to be twelve months away if it does go ahead. The state government's approved it, and it's interesting to note all that great level of objection at the start, all dissolved away. Yeah, all dissolved away, back to essentially one family, and. Most of those people who objected because the, the negative hype was allowed to gather so much momentum and I was a bit disappointed with the, with the company that they didn't try and stand in front of it, but they didn't want to add any fuel to the fire, so yeah. they just let it go. Yeah. So, Danny, sorry, just for people that aren't familiar at all with the story because mm-hmm. our audience spreads beyond just the local community to the surrounding areas as well. Yep. What is the main objection to this proposed project? What was the source of their ire, to, I guess, for lack of a better term, to start with? Well... There's only there's only two points of objection which hold any water whatsoever. One is the change of aesthetics, yep. and I totally respect that. The argument that objectors hung on and tried very hard to win the day with was that this is prime agricultural land. And as a matter of fact and a matter of practicality, it simply isn't. It's dry land farming. The government themselves rates this country between four and six on their own unit of measure, whereas prime is one to three. Mm -hmm. So factually, the argument's flawed. And practically, the argument's flawed. Everybody knows this is a, a, uh, down on the creek flats, is a very wet area. 
the property, the last acquisition down here some years ago, actually failed at auction twice. It was on the market for two years before we bought it. Everybody had the chance to go and buy it if they wanted it. Yeah. So the prime agricultural argument for this, this is good land, don't get me wrong. This is, this is good land, but it's not prime. And the argument was flawed from the first. And I felt like the longer objectors hung on to that argument, they'd lost from the outset. Oh, well, unlucky. <laughs> but lucky, hopefully, for Aubrey Wodonga with the Cancer Centre getting a bit of a kickback. Mate, I, this, I think so. Which is where why I really wanted to ask the question because I know yeah, you're I've, a good dude and, like you said, you've been giving even when you can't give, but sometimes people get caught up in their own agendas and don't realise that there's more to a story than just the penny-pinching Sure. Scenario. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I'm just happy now that, look, things have done a full U-turn. I mean, in the in the, the first round of submissions, I think there were 68 for it and 130 or 40 or something against. Yeah. In the last round of submissions, I think there were 14 against it and 120 for it. Yeah. I'm, I'm reaching back into my memory because it was a year or 18 months ago, but I think that it would be somewhere representative of the numbers. Yeah. And business people in, in Waller and Colcan stood up and supported it because – my argument has always been, I don't want to get bogged down in this, by the way. It's been four years, all this stuff. It's either going to happen or it isn't. Not a, yeah. You know, whatever. Either way. Yeah. But we don't need to speculate with these things. These things are built. They're in country towns already. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Don't pull rubbish out of the sky. Like some of them are trying to, to get support, uh, some naysayers, by saying that they give cows cancer and they're going to drop planes from the sky because of the reflection. And it was childish. Yeah. We don't need to speculate these things. They're built in paddocks all across the country. Go and talk to people. I did. When the company came to me, I said, well, mate, my knee-jerk reaction is I've worked hard to have a farm. I really love where I live. Not in love with the idea. Tell me more about it. Yeah. And then I jumped on a plane. I went to Longreach, and I had to look at one out there, and I got educated. And I thought, okay, well, this is the way of the future. Like it a lump, but this is the way we're going in renewables. Yeah. And we got on board. But, yeah, the point I make is you don't need to speculate. They're built. They're out there. Go and ask people who live next to them who have experienced the uh, rise in commerce and uh, economic stimu- stimulus. Oh, uh, shit. Stimulus. Stimulus. Thank you. That's all right. That's a bit early. I haven't had a beer yet. <laughs> um, the economic stimulus in these towns, and there's no reason to speculate. It's all out there. Go and have a look. Facts and figures. Yeah. There you go. Do we have anything else on that, and, Mel? And sorry, and just to tie off, Mel, I didn't um, – to get probably back to the point you want to talk about, I felt that was an opportunity to vent then because uh, I haven't, had, my, I haven't, no, had, haven't, haven't had an opportunity in four had, years. You haven't. You've got your platform now. Yeah, so thank you. you. Um, we would dearly love to support the Regional Cancer Centre and I haven't said that publicly and I haven't said that even privately to people around here in the four years leading up to this because I didn't want it to look like we were trying to buy favour. Uh-huh. But in recent months, I've, I've been in, in discussions with them because I said, look, we're getting closer and we can dare to dream now. Give us some options. So we're talking about options of um, oncology nurses or doctors or research fellowships. We're not sure which way we're going to go yet mm-hmm. because we're not 100% certain this thing will go ahead yet with COVID and all the rest. We'll just have to see. But I hope we're in a position to um, perpetually support the Regional Cancer Centre in Aubrey if this solar farm goes ahead on half of our farm. We're still staying here. Well, I hope so too because really, like you said, it's going to happen anyway. It's just whether it goes to someone that might channel the money in a different direction or not. <laughs> so, Danny the farmer, we've also talked about your obviously your love for horses and all activities involving horses. Tried include, to bring a few over for you, but they yeah. can't be hungry. So, there is another part of your life, which people may know, that are tuning into this, and that's... Yeah, but I've got to Dan- see my warrant officer twice a week, and we don't need to talk about it <laughs> yeah. anymore. Well, a third part. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned flying up to Longreach, which is a good link into Danny Fegan and the Longreach band. Yeah. Yep. So, so Danny Fegan, the musician. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, long, we played uh, as Longreach for nearly 10 years. Longreach retired three years ago. Now we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of stages. How, did, of how did you get into music? Because I'm going to let you tell the story, but I know that you have a guitar with maybe some bits of wood in it that you might <laughs> like to share. Collected. Collected. Stolen. Yeah. So how did you first start off in music? Well, Dad had uh, piano lessons, I think, for about six months, but uh, he never he never persevered with it. And I think his parents were happy for him to quit. They couldn't really afford them in Golgong, but he always regretted that. So he made me and my two sisters have piano lessons. Mm-hmm. I was never in love with them either, but he made me go to about grade three or something and 
then I quit. But in that time, I took up the guitar under my own steam and um, started singing. And it was just, to be honest, it was money. It was the it was the cash that I saw an opportunity um, that I could work. Yeah. And I started gigging when I was 16, so I didn't miss a beer either. But most of the time on Fridays and Saturday nights uh, when mates were out nightclubbing, I was singing, I was working. As I say, I didn't miss a beer. I'd, I'd always catch up somewhere along the line. But but most of the time when mates were, were out clubbing, I was working, I was singing. So it was certainly money. It was, it was, it was money-driven to start with. Mm-hmm. And it was about the only time I could get any female attention, let's face it. <laughs> so that was, that was another driving force. <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah. And so sorry when you said it was money driven. Obviously you had built up some level of skill before you decided that it could become a commercialized thing because I'm I'm sure at 3 4 5 years old whenever you started playing guitar you weren't thinking about the potential of beers a free meal and a few hundred bucks playing a gig. Well, I didn't start the guitar until I was about 15 or 16. Okay, so it was around the same period. Yeah, it was around, yeah. around about the and same it, time. Sorry, is that why you were you always a fan of country music because as yeah. someone that's familiar with the music industry country is one of the more financially viable genres if you were going to pick one it actually has a live scene or were you, was that just always going to be the genre anyway no well it wasn't the genre for starters I, actually i was probably a bit younger than that. i was probably about 13 or 14 when i started learning guitar but i cut my teeth on 50s 60s rock and roll i'd started a duo with a cousin the same age we were 16 we played a new year's eve at henty bowling club i think we had a blue on the way home and um <laughs> that's I was, an unusual story Bob. yeah <laughs> Yeah, Not. <laughs> and uh, and I, I ended up with all these gigs that I had to do on my own and I'd only really just started duoing and the thought of soloing was a little bit daunting. So when I was a kid growing up, mum and dad used to have an open house policy on a Friday night on our um, old farm out at Thaguna, Danmara Park out there. Dad had set up a music room with a PA system and a drum kit and it was just open house if we knew they come out. And yeah. um, so they'd tear it up every Friday night and... Uh, it sort of morphed into a bit of an army following from Latchford as well. And one of the fellows who used to come out, Alwyn Brunton, he would would sing out there most Friday nights. And when and and Bruno's probably I'd have to be in his mid sixties now, I suppose. He's quite a bit older than me. But when I thought I was going to be stuck, uh, I reached out to Bruno and said, "Would you help me do some of these gigs?" And of course, um, you know, he, he was a product of of the fifties and sixties and all that sort of thing. And um, so for ten years, we duo doing 50s, 60s rock and roll at the commercial club and all over the place. But country was always my go-to to to listen to, like Pa Freer, who, you know, half raised me, really. He always had Hank Williams and Slim Dusty live at Wagga Wagga playing in his car and Chad Morgan and John Denver and all that sort of stuff. So country was always my go-to to to listen to. And when we started with the Longreach Band, um, we aimed that way. Uh, We were were very cover-driven and about halfway or three quarters through the long reach journey i i decided i was sort of getting over playing at three or four in the morning three nights a week at pubs and things and i i really enjoyed the festival scene yep and of course everyone does but it's hard to get into them because you know you you're playing four hours in a pub gig you do a 45 minute set or a 55 minute set in a festival you're getting paid the same and yep. often it's in the day you're not dealing with drunks at three in the morning following out the car and but I couldn't get any more festivals. I didn't have enough street cred because I didn't have an album. I, I mm. didn't have anything. I'd never written a song. Okay. Well, I tried to, but never really devoted any energy. I didn't feel like I was ever in the headspace to write songs. I was always too busy. And what sort of started, it was a, a mate who was working at Jabiru flew over to Weeper for a bit of work and he told the committee up there at the bull ride, he said, oh, I know this really good bloke, you know, he's, he goes, well, you should book him for the bull ride. And this fella, Steve, i become real good mates with Steve. I actually just stayed with him for two weeks last month up at Weeper before lockdown. It's about five years ago, he rang me up. He said, Danny, we heard you go all right. He said, uh, this bull ride you know, goes pretty good. We had three or four thousand people to it. And he said, um, send us up your album. He said, we'll put it to the committee. I said, oh, I've never recorded. <laughs> he said, oh, no worries. He said, just give us your YouTube. I haven't got one. Yeah. <laughs> he said, Jesus, said Facebook page. I said, Oh, I've got a personal one, but there's no music on it. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, Oh, God, mate. He said, I'm trying to help you out here. Can you give me anything? I said, Oh, well, I can give you a poster from last Saturday night at Kinross and Mum's phone number. She reckons we go her off. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he took a punt on us, but it sort of got me thinking, Well, I need a bit of that sort of background stuff to get a bit more street cred to get more festivals. That's where I want to go. So I. I'd sort of half started a lot of songs and and um, 
I, I focused some energy on on trying to finish them, and I'd, I'd written a book about the campfires against cancer, ride, right? mm-hmm. And I found up at Middle was a good place to go and get some headspace for that. And that got, I know I'm digressing here, but that got picked up for a publish, which was a fluke. I only blundered into getting published, and uh, I told the publisher I didn't want anything out of it. We'll give it to the Regional Cancer Centre. So that book raised 54 grand for them. But I, as a product of that, I sort of knew that was a good place for me to go and clear my head. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'd go up there and uh, I knocked out nine or ten songs that I'd already started over the years. And I remember a mate saying to me, uh, to write a song, you've just got to put pen to paper. He said, you might write a hundred songs and only one's any good. Yep. And I thought, Jesus, I hope my strike rate's a, strike rate's a bit better than that because I've only written ten and they're all going to be in the album. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's, anyway. that's everyone's first album. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many songs have you got? Ten. How many tracks is it going to be? Ten. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine ended up being 16. I added a few covers on there, which was a blue in hindsight because it excluded me from some golden guitar nominations. There was too, yeah, had too many covers and stuff on there. I, I was in the swim for three, but, um, it excluded me for two others. So this next album will be all originals, but yeah, anyway, I, I did that and, um, Got it out there, and then it went to number one on the RA charts. It, it sort of, and the the film clips went well. I used the right people for those, and um, it did its job. It got us a bit more street cred, and we can now sort of fill our year in with some festivals and and better caliber of stuff. Can yeah. Can I ask about the first time? Because I know that I was in an original band for a long time, and then I played in a cover band at uni. But I had it was basically the same band. Yep, most of the same people, and our actual music was a little bit more fast-paced aggro technical than our actual covers were so we just pretended that people loved it because it was louder and heavier yeah yeah what was it like the first time you played your own song in a cover set do you remember that reaction of the crowd like or Slow did, did, burn. did you even mention it was your song or did you just play it as though it wasn't uh it was a slow burn um there's a couple of questions and i like like to answer answer them all because yep. they're good questions it was it was a slow burn. I find I'm a, I'm a, I'm a funny artist. I, I said to the producer, I said, I don't even know what I am. I said, we get paid to play upbeat country rock because we get paid to play at radios and things that get people dancing, having a good time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I listen to is quirky stuff. I love Cor Blund. He's a, a Canadian folk singer. Um, okay. uh, those type of blokes who are very lyric sort of driven rather than, than music driven. Uh, I've gone a bit vague down here. I'm trying to think a couple of other artists I listen to. It's always hard getting interviewed in your own place. You look around, you see all the jobs you need to do. <laughs> um, but those sort of quirky alternate country types I listen to, and when I write, it tends to come out sincere folk, slower sort of stuff, you know, real stories and things like that, which is exactly the opposite of what we're paid to sing. Yep. So I was a little bit anxious to perform those sort of songs, and, and actually most of them have dropped off the set list, those slower ones, which are my favourite songs, before Grog got a hold of me and Little Man and those sort of things. Yeah. So the way I'm trying to write this next album is the same way that I write, which is lyric-driven and maybe sincere, but just give the producer the um, the brief to give it more of an upbeat beat, and as you're saying, a little bit quicker upbeat beat and sort of crank it a little bit more so I can get away with playing it live. Yeah. Because I don't know whether people that haven't experienced that moment, there's so much more emotion tied up in something you've created yourself than there ever is in playing someone else's song. I mean, when you're doing a four-hour show, that's what I'm referring to there. Yep. Because that's kind of you moving from doing a job to expressing yourself back into doing a job. Yeah, yeah, totally. And when the crowd's not on board with it, you can really feel like, well, we haven't done our job properly because we've lost the crowd here. Oh, but totally. also, that's the yeah. song we wrote. It would have been good to get some reaction. Hundred <laughs> percent, you know. And you just know too that um, when you, if you, if you're with a crowd that aren't particularly aware of you or or, or me as an artist, mm. you just know when you pull this slow original out, they're all going to go to the dunny or go and get a drink. Where the happy guy goes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you think, ah, oh, crap. Yeah, originals coming up. Yeah, yeah. So it was a slow burn, but but it's it's. I remember Sarah Stora played at the gym to Mud Bulls and Music Bash one night, and I was in the crowd, and uh, she came out a few rums with us afterwards, and I caught up with Lee Kerning, and he's a local boy, of course. Yep. And um, she quite sincerely said to the crowd, she stopped in the middle of one of her songs because the mosh pit was singing the words, and she said, "Wow," she said, "I think I'm really getting there. You know my song." And I often relay that story on stage because um, although it's been a slow burn with my originals, it's a real treat when you actually just stop for a minute and you see the crowd is singing your song back to you, which you wrote. And but it takes time, yeah, for that to filter through and filter down. 
than my favourite song, which was not my favourite. <laughs> which, when I first got made to listen to that song, I just was taking the piss out of it, basically. And then it just became so ingrained. It's now like my fa- one of my favourite songs. I don't know. It's not mine. It's a um, great film clip. But, I, I love yeah, the film clip. Tell us about the film clip. But but this, I'll just tap yeah. it back on the yeah. song. I'm glad you like it. But for me, it's it's exactly the type of song I struggle to write yeah. because it's very, I don't know, it just seems run-of-the-mill yeah. Australian rock country. So what does but that it, sound like for people that aren't familiar with the genre? Like who's a big artist that they might be familiar with? Oh, I'm not, no, not going to do it. No. <laughs> oh, that's right. It sounds like Danny Fagan. Not going to throw anyone a, under the bus uh, at all. Uh, no. yeah. it's, it's a very, it's a very um, well-used beat and all that sort of stuff, yeah. you know, and it's um, – Familiar. I, I've yeah. always said that I just can't – I hate swearing on microphones, but I yeah. feel like I've got to say this. Yeah. No, you can we, say anything okay. on this show. Yeah. I just can't write about big tits and green tractors. <laughs> you know, like, and that's a lot of what some of this modern country music yeah. is. I, yeah. I just yeah. it can't yeah. be that shallow. Um, yeah. And I felt like that song wasn't that bad, but it was a little bit shallow, yeah. you know, like, yeah. and, but it was commercially consumable. Yeah. So I, I had fun with the film clip on that song, but I'm okay that you didn't like it at the start. No. But but I've I've got no doubt that it sticks in your head because it's one of those exactly. typical catchy little bloody yeah. tunes. If you like us, like I like us, get on to punchingsideways.com, give us a bit of a likesy, have a bit of an exploration around and maybe buy us a coffee. Going from that, because film clip is shot up at Mitter, for that song, isn't it? And uh, here, just where you're sitting here oh, and, and at Mitter, yeah. Here and at Mitter. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I didn't know we, that. We put that um, buck out shoot in for the film clip because we bucked a couple of bulls out there and a lot of it didn't make the A reel, uh, which was a shame because I wanted it to be really, you know, buck and bull heavy. Yeah. Um, the worst mistake I made was not cutting that bloody shoot out as soon as we're finished because every time I get down here on a weekend, my young bloke's bucking out steers with his mates and everything and just see broken wrists and something. I should oh, cut it out. Yes, probably. <laughs> yeah. But no, then we moved up to – we played at Bully OB&S. Yep, I remember that. That night on the Saturday night and then on the Sunday the plan was to go to Mitter and we nearly didn't go to Mitter because it they'd rained about two inches that night and the creek was running a banker and uh, the boys from Longreach had beat me to it. They got up there because I was with the filmery guys doing the film clip. And uh, and Matt Scullion, um, who wrote the song with me, and um, Matt's had about 20 number one hits, you know, yeah. um, in the country scene. He wrote for Cole Chisley, he writes for Lee Kernigan, cool fella. He was camped here too, so we all went up together and the boys from Longreach rang me and said, oh, mate, sorry, it's not much of a day, like, a bit like today, I'm frozen, Danny. Yeah, I've got the shakes. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually thinking, if because I don't feel the cold really at all. I, right. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the heat. If I'm a little bit cold, Mel would be freezing. Oh, me too. I'm sitting here in a T-shirt. I've chipped three teeth. We're, it's both, a bit hard too we're you, both too scrawny, Danny. <laughs> and you can see how nice that sun is that's 10 feet away. We, we were born in a drought, mate. That's the trouble. Yeah. Anyway, anyway we, we went up to um, Mitta and yeah, when the boys rang me ahead of time and said, oh, mate, the creek's just running a banker, it's rah, rah, and I said, oh, damn it, you know, I've got these fellas down from Sydney filming and pay some girls to model and you know, all this sort of stuff and I thought, bloody hell. Uh, I thought, you know what, nature just normally looks after me for one reason or another. I don't know if you've seen the From Where I Stand video clip, but mm. that was filmed here on our farm. And nature and my mate's farm up here in the Ambler Ranges, um, the Phillips property. Nature just came out to dance with us so beautifully that weekend. And I said, Bugger, I'm going to keep the faith. It'll be right. Whatever it is, it'll be. Yep. When I get up there, the creek is running over the pylons about two feet. <laughs> and the boys are looking at me, kicking an empty coke can, like, Oh, sorry. So I said, Sorry, what are you talking about? It's freaking awesome. Get your yeah. shoes off and get in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had this drum kit and we decided to cut the front out of the drum kit and put a big rock in the middle of it so it sat there and didn't get swept yeah, nice. away by the water. <laughs> yeah. And it was awesome. It was amazing. It was freezing. And we all ended up in the creek at the end of it. But it was unreal. Definitely have to check out that film clip. Yeah, we'll it, put a link in for that for people that haven't seen it. So you mentioned a couple of film clips there. With the progression of the music, have you also progressed in terms of the film clips, in, in terms of what you're trying to achieve? Yeah. Yeah, I've got, well, for my level and for my budget, I've got some pretty epic ideas for the next two. I think they're going to be a lot of fun, but they've been on the radar for about 12 months. You know, the bushfire slowed us down, then COVID, Mark 1, then COVID, Mark 2. It's Everything just feels like it's a false start at the minute. You can't sink your teeth into anything. Okay, so big diversion, which I like to throw a few in. Mm-hmm. 
you've just talked about being roadblocked in your creativity and Mel and I have talked to a few people about this but no one that's making country music and film clips. How, how have those moments felt where you've had plans and you've had things in the world stop you from doing it and how are you coping each time it happens? Mate, I'm coping all right because I've got plenty of things going on and the, and the kids keep us busy, you know, and really at our stage of life it's all about them now. But um, I can totally see how people in hospitality and in the arts – have fallen in a heap over all this. Like we did the, uh, I played at Great Keppel Island. What month are we up to? You yeah. played it in July. We're in. Oh, wow. Was it back that far? Yeah. <laughs> September. Okay. We we're on the road for six weeks with the kids. We went up to Weeper and um, we like to try and take them out of school each year for a month or more and, you know, just show them a bit of stuff, get them around Australia and so they can talk about things from a bit of an informed platform, you know, like all the issues that, that come with being out bush. And we went up to Weeper and down the East Coast uh, in time for country on Keppel at Great Keppel Island. And I sung out there, had a great weekend, sang with James Blundell and a uh, heap of other artists. It was, it was brilliant. It always is out there. But when we left, we're on our way home, and that was when uh, Queensland was about to lock New South out for being on the stink with COVID. So... I knew that if I crossed the border, I wasn't going to be able to go back for the Weeper Bull Ride in four weeks, which we were booked to play at, and I was going to fly back up there with the band, and we love that weekend. You know, we go up there, we have two nights with our mates, then we overnight in Cairns and play up as a band on the way home, and, and that's all good stuff too, you know. And I was I was sort of gut shot about it, really. I stood on the border for an hour and a half, and because we've got so many kids, we always take, like I tow that horse float there with the F truck, we camp in, and Caroline takes the cruiser. And, and she said to me, well, she said, well, you you stay. You go back to Queensland or stay in Queensland, do some songwriting because James offered to write a song with me, James Blundell and Briar, his son. Uh, they're probably at Stanthorpe. I thought, well, I can catch up with them for a couple of nights. There's an old fella called Kelly Dixon who's pretty crook at the moment. He wrote Leave Him Out There in the Long Yard for Slim Dusty and him and I have, have pretty well nearly written a song about my um, my great mate who did the campfires against cancer ride with me and ironically died of cancer about three years ago. I thought I could finish that off with Kelly there's a, another girl over in the Gold Coast who I sang with at um, Great Keppel Island. We we're going to write a song. I could have done a bit of stuff, you know, and, yep. but four weeks was a long time away from the kids. And then when I spoke to the bull ride. They said there was a positive case in Mareeba and they might shut the top end down anyway. So I hovered around the border for an hour and a half. And I thought, ah, oh, bugger it, I'll go home then. Um, but I was gut shot about it. I thought I'm missing out and, you know, some of this travel. But then I had to give myself a kick in the backside and say, well, how lucky were you that it all opened up for six weeks and allowed me to do that holiday with Caroline and the kids mm. and sing on a tropical island for three days. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Yeah, put it all in perspective. But I've got a lot of other stuff going on with the kids and the farm and everything too, which consumes your mind. I think if you were totally reliant on music, I couldn't have, I couldn't think of a worse 18 months. I think it'd be terrible. Have you? How have you gone? Have you spoken with people that are a bit down in the mouth? Have you been down in the mouth? Well, I personally, and people that know, have listened to the show know this story, so I'll keep it short, but I re-changed a bunch of stuff in my life to potentially make a move so I could start doing stand-up comedy. Just, okay. I mean, just as a side hobby thing, but to take it more seriously. And then we had the fires and my dad was up in Corriong and I was really his only local evacuation point other yep. than Melbourne. So I was the only one close to him. So I didn't go anywhere then. And then COVID. So moving to Melbourne to not be able to do it because I wouldn't have been able to go out and do it was pretty hard because I'd kind of changed things around in my life. But I think it was more the second time when it looked as though the middle of last year things might have been changing. And then it basically has, if anything, become worse and more locked down over that period. More uncertainty this More time uncertainty, too, isn't it? You yeah. can't plan for anything. Yeah, so the lack of being able to see, because when it first happened, I was seeing still a date in my head. Yeah. That, I mean, this is what we're all optimistic about X. I'm going to just peg my timeline on X. Maybe stay around here, but travel, start driving yep. to Canberra and Sydney and Melbourne particularly. But it just isn't realistic to go there and potentially not be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, I've heard other stories like that. People trying to release albums and they can't tour them. And oh, 100%. I should have had this to, album finished 18 months yeah, ago. Having to cancel like launch shows. I mean, yeah. launch shows in the grand scheme of the music industry might not be massive, but if you're a band from Aubrey and you've been making it in your bedroom for two years it's and, a big deal. and it sounds really friggin' awesome. Yeah, it's a big deal. You want to come out and play at least a couple of shows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know where other people are at. I probably should do some more investigation as to how other people are feeling, but I know it's been tough. So Yeah, I, I, I think so. And I, I think, look, I, I used to be a bit, be a bit flippant about that sort of stuff. I'm very lucky. I don't, I don't get depressed 
or anything like that, I, I'd get sad. But as I've said to some friends who do get down in the mouth, you know, I'm lucky that for me it's an emotion, not a condition. Uh, I can shake it off. Nothing gets me sadder than a good song that comes on when you're on your own driving somewhere. I pull over and bore quite often, you yeah. know, like that's just beautiful. But I shake it off and I keep going. But I think even for a bloke like me who used to to think of that subject rather flippantly has to acknowledge that um, it's been a tough period for a lot of people and a lot of people aren't quite right. I've got mates who are really blokey blokes, you know, in Victoria in that first lockdown that was locked down for so long. They're really blokey blokes and they were down their mouth and some of their wives reached out and said, can you just give such and such a call and just check in, you know, like, they're not right. And that really surprised me. It has knocked a lot of people around. Yeah. And, you know, and some people say, oh, we haven't fought a world war. We haven't done this. And oh, I respect that too. We haven't suffered near to the degree of some of our forefathers have. But in our own reality and our own lifetime, this is a big deal. Yeah. It's our story. And yeah, no, exactly. We don't have that other perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah. Our true north uh, and our our lane is a bit different to what it was a hundred years ago. So yeah. it's still real. It's it's still a um it's a massive um adjustment. Anyway, don't country music writers like oh, writing three, depressing three shit. Three chords anyway. and a heartbreak, that's all you need. <laughs> three chords and a heartbreak. Perfect, perfect. So you've got three chords and a heartbreak, that's one genre. Then you've got tractors and boobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's gotta be a third one. What's the third genre? Oh, no, dogs that won't come when you call them. Yeah. <laughs> I got very Pet lucky. And um, their short careers. Yeah. <laughs> I got very lucky to um, host the regional originals back when we were sort of borderline in and out, in and out. I wear my shirt with pride. In in Aubrey and got to see some of this new, I'm going to call it evolved or maybe Aurora mm. version of you expressing yourself. Can you just tell me how it felt that night? Obviously, it was a very small audience because we had restrictions and everything like that, but how it felt to just sit there, just you and your guitar and just sing all the songs that you wanted to sing. I love that, and I don't get an opportunity to do that enough. Like, uh, I feel like I didn't finish answering your question before, but I'm back on track now. When you're talking about originals and those type of things, and I, I tend to write quite wordy, slow originals, that's another reason why I like these festivals because they often afford you the chance to back up next day for a recovery breakfast or something. You mm-hmm. do you do the big high volume show on the Saturday night, but there's often a marquee the next morning and a chance to tell those mm-hmm. stories associated with those original songs. And I love that festival. I had a great time that night, particularly when people are engaged and they're locked in on you and they're listening to everything you're saying and having a laugh and, you know, following the journey. And it was, as you say, it was a lot rawer. And I think um, my songwriting has evolved as well. I mean, that album was kind of my first crack at it. But I there's a couple of tracks that I don't like on that album that sort of irk me. I fast forward them as well. And I just, I use those type of environments, like the original, um, Originals Festival, as a chance to try some new stuff. And I've always said that if my new songs don't pass the campfires test, they're not going to go on the album. And that gets back to what you were saying before, Josh where you throw them out and you don't tell them they're yours. You're sitting around a campfire, you're doing your Waylon Jennings one, your Hank Williams one or, or whatever, everyone's singing along and then just randomly throwing one of yours. Yeah. I reckon if you can keep their attention through that without announcing it's yours, well, that, there must be something going that's pretty right about it. Yeah, if you but want it, to ruin a gig, say this is one of our originals. 100%. <laughs> don't ever do yeah. that. <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Toilet break. Yeah, yep. totally. Yeah. yeah, my shout. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go to the bar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Did I answer your question? So yeah. with this new music, and I didn't get to see that particular gig, but I do remember Mel saying that the songs were really good and there was a musical development, but it was the stories that you were telling between and after songs. And if an emotion came up, maybe from playing a song, you were telling stories about the stuff you played and what you're about to play. Yeah. Obviously, you wouldn't get a chance to do that in a lot of the circumstances no. where, where you're hired to entertain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, our our uh, entertainment set is probably still covers heavy. I reckon it's probably sixty percent covers, forty percent originals, yep. and certainly no slow originals. Um, so those opportunities are great. I love telling those stories. Obviously, I talk a bit. So, <laughs> was there anything that night that people have come to you about since? Because we've talked about the regional originals festival, what yep. it was on the show before, so people have some idea what it is. Yeah. Is there any follow up that people have given you about a particular song you you sang or? Any particular story you told? Oh, just um, 
the repeat similarities of what people are saying about the songs resonates a bit with me that you you know you you know you, you could probably pull it out of your shirt and get it right one night but I've tried them out half a dozen times now and people tend to say the same things the fight song was written just for a joke a mate and I we used to spar two mornings a week and then we go and get a coffee and um I said to him one day I said you know what the trouble is with you and me Mark is because you always start quite respectfully in the first round by the fifth round we're trying to take our heads off <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the trouble is, Mark, I said, you think you're better than me, but deep down I reckon I'm better than you. <laughs> so things just tend to escalate through the rounds. <laughs> so I wrote this fight song and I only wrote it as a bit of a joke and I've pulled that out probably half a dozen times now. The first time I played it was at the regional yeah. um, originals uh, and I still had all the lyrics written down in my guitar case there trying to follow it, you know, and I – I've played it six times now. The last time I played it was up at Great Keppel Island and Ian Dixon was in the um, in the crowd. You know, Dicko used to do Australian Idol. Yeah. Uh, he's a really good fellow. We've, we've bumped into him just randomly in our travels a few times and he's managing one of the um, acts that were up there. And he came to me on the Sunday night as everyone's getting fairies home and everything and it's it's a real downer. That's like a bang and a whisper, you know, like three days just full on then fairy just starts carting them off the island. Mm. Oh, that's the end. Yep. <laughs> And Dicko came up and James Blunder was there and um, a few other people were all having just something to eat and a drink around the table. And he slapped me on the back and he said that that song was the highlight of his weekend. Wow. And I said, really? And, it, and someone filmed it. It's on Facebook. It might be on my page. I don't know. But someone filmed the whole show. It was Riders in the Round. So there was James Blundell, Matty Cornell, Brad Butcher and me. So you get to tell your stories on a stool and taking turns for an hour and a half doing your songs. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it was really cool. And, um, oh, everyone was laughing. And it was, yeah, and for Dicko to say that, you know, that was really cool. He said it was the highlight of his weekend. He said, because I filled the whole island with love and happiness. He said, everyone was just laughing. And, and I thought, well, that's really cool. And I didn't even think that song would make the album. It was only a bit of a, just a thing I chalked out, but it, it certainly will now. Yeah, well, that's good feedback. And yeah. you didn't do the mistake that I used to do when people would compliment my old bands. You didn't start telling them how they were wrong. Ah, uh, well, a little bit. Yeah, your compliments are hard to, to wear, aren't we've, they? Well, that's how Mel and I got to know each other. Yeah. We worked out we're equally poor at taking them. So. Not good at getting compliments. Yeah, no, but that, no you, I'm not either. That's something that creatives learn over time is when someone gives you a genuine compliment, particularly if they're coming from a place of real knowledge, like he is, as to what's a great atmosphere and song. Sometimes you just got to shut up and say thanks. And that's Absolutely. it. <laughs> and if you don't agree with them. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Because yeah. and sometimes if clearly you clearly your feeling on the song at that point wasn't that it was making an album. It was no, just a song exactly. in the set. And now yeah, you exactly. might you've, you look as though and sound as though you've changed your mind about it. Oh, I'll put it because I've, I've got an idea for a film clip too, so I think it'll <laughs> tick a few boxes. But yeah. <laughs> if we go down to Adrenaline Gym down there, so we'll put on a fight night hopefully. Um, and um, Yeah. Oh, I don't know, it's got all these ideas that then the band just turn on each other and belting the crap out of each other and throwing <laughs> drums and stuff and smashing guitars. It should be a bit of fun. <laughs> but you're right, compl- for, for some people, and obviously us three, the same compliments are hard to wear. And, and uh, when you argue the point of a compliment, sometimes it looks like you're fishing for a double down on compliments too, yes. which is ap- absolutely counterproductive uh, yep. to what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, and you're kind of stealing the joy that they got out of the thing. Yeah, totally, Because you're yeah. not sharing that with them. You're yeah. telling them they're wrong. <laughs> we, we all say we're our own worst critics, and I think um, people who are own, their own worst critics are the ones who um, suffer compliments the most. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. But you're right. You've got to learn to just say thank you. And I did. I just I just shook his hand. And I said, oh, thanks very much, mate. Good on you. That means a lot. Oh, that's and cool. I walked away <laughs> thinking, but I cocked up verse six. and I- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> also an unsolicited... Oh, that sounds a bit like back of it's your, perfect word, your, your granddad's <laughs> pawn shop. <laughs> but um, when it when it's not You're someone, such a pawn, <laughs> when it's um, <laughs> someone that has no reason to give you that compliment, like it doesn't serve them any purpose yeah, other exactly. than like you usually get family or friends or whatever. Oh, that was unreal. That was, unreal. and I I don't think that they bear as much weight as someone that sort of just made the, made the effort to. Yeah. To come and yeah. do it. So yeah. Agreed. So you did mention in there, probably just to finish up, we've been going for over an hour. So mm. you said that you were reading the lyrics out of your guitar case. And Mel's told me a lot about this guitar, and I'm assuming it's the guitar. And can you tell us the story about how that came to be and why it's so special to you? I just like, if I need something, I like to build it. Um, I've noticed. Yeah. Everything, yeah. I, it took us... Nearly an hour to actually start recording because we were going. Oh, I've built this and I did this, and 
Uh, and Only because you asked. Was that not fishing for compliments as well? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tell me I did a good job. I just stopped giving them after the yeah. first half hour. Yeah. <laughs> I've taken a mental list when we stop recording. Too. You, you missed some things. <laughs> we'll, we'll put a big list. See that Yambler range over there? Yeah. You know, I, I dug the valley in front of it to fill that up. <laughs> <laughs> but your guitar. So can you tell us, you just were saying you like to build things if you need it. If I need it, I like to build it. Yeah, like I, um, when we, we moved into town, uh, Carolyn and I moved off our respective family farms into town for a couple of years when we first got married. We had a little house in there and, and uh, the neighbour built knives. So he taught me how to build knives and so I used to do a lot of that, pocket knives and bowies and things and I just got an appreciation of timbers. And uh, I wanted a new guitar. I had a couple out here. I've never been really that happy with ink that I've had. There's a um, a Luther in town, Joe Gallagher. I don't know if you know Joe. Yeah, I've heard the name a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. he's a terrific bloke. I borrowed some templates of Joe Gallagher <laughs> to forward that cause. And I, I've collected a heap of timbers over the years for the knife making and the handles and things like that too. So I had an old Mulga post I picked up in Simpson Desert years ago when I did a trip across there and... Um, I had timbers from my three favourite pubs. I took a slice off the um, beer garden at Mitter, uh, or the big poster out the back there. Mm -hmm. That's the fretboard on it. Um, The back is the old Gerogery horse stable there, which I had to knock down. It was only white ants holding hands at the end of the day, so I knocked (laughs) that down and built that stage there for a bit of music. So that's on the back of the guitar. I got some floorboard from the uh, toilet, boys' toilet at Kinross Pub. I snapped that up and put it on the back too. I would have taken it from the bar, only that Nick put security cameras in there in about 2008 or nine, so. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and just other teams. A bit of snow gum there from when uh, where me and the boys used to go Brumby running. Uh, a bit of snow gum on the back. Uh, bunya pines on the front. It's all Australian materials. A mate and I uh, have had an opal mine at Lightning Ridge for about 15 years. So I've put opals in as fret markers. So yeah. just everything tells a story on it, and I love it. It's great. You know, I, I always said I wanted to build my own guitar, but always cited that I was too busy to do it. And uh, ironically, that period that I built the guitar in, I'd never been busier in my life. That was yeah. the year that we were running the pub and, and all these other things. But it was just great therapy. I'd just come home at night and start whittling away on the neck. And, and I was never stressed for a minute. It was really cool for three months while I built it until I'd nearly finished it. And then yeah. I thought, oh, God, don't bugger it up now. <laughs> and I did. I went out there drunk one night, half drunk one night, VB Starby. I thought I'm just going to stamp my name on this, the first one, and I stamped it upside down. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, that almost makes the story better. Yeah, well, it's mine. It's done a heap of work. It flies everywhere with me. It's been up to Arnhem Land, across to Western Australia. and it's. um, This is all the upside down stamp guitar, or did you build a second one? No, no. I've been trying to build a second one for the last 12 months too. got the timber picked out and everything. So did these venues know that you were just acquiring timber? No. No. Well, they don't now. <laughs> Actually, um, so Mel, you get up to the Middle Valley a bit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was when they did all the renos on the Laurel, yeah, Laurel okay. Hotel up there. Yeah. And um, I was a bit dusty and I walked across the store to get a coffee and I thought, oh, I can't be bothered walking back around here because mum and dad have got a little cabin down near the water. Yeah. And um, I thought, oh, I'll just walk through the pub, you know, it's all walls are knocked down anyway. And as I walked through there, I heard one of the builders say, that is the hardest piece of wood I've ever seen in my life. I bloody buggered three bits trying to drill a hole and rah rah. And it. I sort of backwards step. Like, Which bit's the hardest bit you've ever seen? I'll make a perfect fretboard. Yeah. So I grabbed a wheelbarrow and knocked off an offcut. Nice. That's good. <laughs> One quick thing just before we finish. What would you like to build that you haven't yet? Oh, I don't know. It's. I'm not not much good at these things or anything really. I just back myself in to have a try, you know. Yeah. Um, same as singing. I'm only a bloody six out of ten singer, but I don't <laughs> mind trying. I don't know. I'd like to. I built. Uh, I built. I bought that saddle there from a mate of mine called uh, named Lockie Cosser, who does the Outback Stockman Show at Longreach mm-hmm. every afternoon this time of year. And now that I've seen it, I'd like to build my own saddle. Yeah. Because the kids have already commandeered that one anyway. Yeah. I think Jess took that one. I only just unwrapped it. Yeah. fortnight ago and she said dad i need a new saddle so jess has got my saddle bill's got my horse <laughs> build my own saddle and build my own horse and i could there put my go. own stamp on Just those upside your own, down <laughs> build your own horse uh, the second one's going to be a little bit yeah. harder yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. might want to stay off the vbs when you're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you so much Thanks, for Sonny. giving us your time 
I feel like place. we probably could do it again in the future. That oh. We've only just scratched the surface. I know from talking to Danny that like, there's a million other stories. Talk too much. Caroline yeah. reckons I was vaccinated with a gramophone needle. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> By the way, I really like her. She just sort of just sits back and just... You've you've got a good one there with Kaz. She, she's the yin to my yang. Yeah. Yang to my yin. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know Caroline is actually a very accomplished musician? She's an eighth grade pianist and she won't play for anybody, not even me. Really? I went to third grade. I'm pretty crap at it. Yeah. I'll play for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> so is that the longest con ever? Has she just told you that? Never actually played for you? No, or? that's how we got together. Okay. I um <laughs> I I uh I conned her into teaching me how to play piano man. Nice. I already knew how to play it, but <laughs> yeah. but I got to touch your hand, yeah, yeah. and that was the end of it. So how do I help, how do I do this? Chord? <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. I just That's can't crazy. get the figuring right. Yeah, exactly. Help me, help yeah. me. So do you think she she's holding herself back so that you can be successful? She's like the ultimate partner. Kaz she might... just loves keeping the home fires burning. Yeah, she, we often have a saying that um, Caroline likes being home. I like coming home. Nice. Yeah, it's a nice, it's nice a good way, way to finish to end. up. Yeah. Right. Well, Danny, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to actually meet you. I've seen yeah, you, you play too, a few Josh. times. You, mate. I've already met him. Yeah, you've already. <laughs> and he try, tries to avoid me, but I've tracked him down now. Yeah, and that's he's, it. He's been a fool to let me know where he lives. Yeah. Mel, Mel is number one. Mel says, "Can we come and do a radio interview?" I said, "Yeah, no worries." But can you remind me the day before, <laughs> yep. the morning off, and then an hour before? Yep. <laughs> and, uh, just to go completely break the fourth wall, I think that I got a message to remind Mel to remind me. <laughs> <laughs> See, we we got it done though. We had yeah, a, we did. a flawless plan. We're we had here now. Reminders everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. guys. Well, you can go to punchingsideways dot com. Everything that Danny's mentioned today, including the film clip will be there mm-hmm. and yep. yeah thanks so cool. much mate it's a real pleasure to meet you and have you on good night josh thanks mel thanks bye what do you think it was awesome yeah i loved everything about it let's just paint a picture of rocking up to his place now we're obviously not going to say the address or anything like this but let's just paint the picture of turning up to danny fegan's abode. Well, to begin with, we pulled off a road, a country road. It was a pretty well looked after road through this massive stone gate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it reminded me a lot of, as a kid, some of the big homesteads that were really old around Holbrook where my grandparents lived. Yeah. They just had these really, ornate's the wrong word because these are more big fortress looking kind of stone gates. And he had one of those. So I felt kind of welcome and at home and we hadn't even opened the car door yet. Yeah. (laughs) And then he sort of sent a message and said, oh, I'm just out the back washing the ute. (laughs) And we got a bit of a tour and there was like, I saw a guy that I've known for ages who just happened to be a, like, had seen gigs of Danny's, his name's Scott Redman and he's from like out my way and he'd just become friends with him and now he's got work with Danny. Like it's that sort of connectability, which was really cool. Um, We got to like all the stuff there in that area he's made himself or done up himself so by stuff we're talking renovations around the house yards these incredible yards yeah and a bar and he was talking about building another shed that he reckons is going to be done like yeah shearing shed he's going to do a shearing shed like he's done all the the cattle yards he's done he did up like the old original homestead there which was from something like 1880 or something like that yeah and it was just really cool. It was full of all this history. And it was also, guys, and I really am sorry about this, but there was too much to talk about. Like I went in with like Danny's going to be cool and everything, but then your brain just exploded just with what was in front of you. We did half an hour of farm talk. Yeah, and it was just <laughs> I'd, you've missed out on so much and I apologise about that and hopefully we'll get him on um, I don't again. know if it made the audio, but I did say there's obviously – Way more we can talk to him about. Oh, yeah. heaps, heaps. And he just, that same character trait, which I said to you, I was like, he's just such a nice guy and was super generous and just almost like, I don't understand why you're here yep. interviewing me at all, but I'll give you a, yeah, he was give very you my time. <laughs> considering he's obviously a very hardworking farmer mm-hmm. and he's also had this other career. Yeah. And studied something well outside of agriculture when he went to uni. Yeah. And his family's not really so much in the agricultural business or heritage, 
and he's also a musician and all this is happening contemporaneously and he doesn't seem to have he's not really locked into a stereotype of any one of those types of people. No. Nah. Like yeah. even the country music kind of lead singer stereotype. I mean, I grew up in Coryong, so there's a big festival up there every year. Yeah. I saw lots of country music celebrities mm-hmm. or semi celebrities a lot when I was a kid. And they did have a bit of an air about them and he had none. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember saying when we were about to get a photo, oh, you don't have your howdy cowdy hat on <laughs> like this. And he just goes, no, I don't have my howdy cat. Like he just had no chip on his shoulder at yeah. all and it was really refreshing. The one thing that really, really impressed me out of the whole interview was that that massive chunk of land that he has is something that he has bought. He hasn't inherited it like most big farms or anything like that. He has worked his absolute butt off. And I have the ultimate respect for that, like ridiculous respect. <laughs> it's funny, talking about the work, it ties into my, I guess, my main takeaway, and that's that a lot of musicians will never admit that the monetary compensation of making music is a driver. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people that I know that is the thing they care most about. Yeah. Because in the moment, back in the day, when they might have felt like I was un- underpaying them by a tiny little bit or the crowd wasn't quite what they expected, mm-hmm. the money was top of mind. Yeah. And these these were died in the wall. Money doesn't matter to us people. Yeah. Him just admitting it was a consideration from him from day one. If I'm yeah. going to go out and learn all this music and have to play other people's songs and sing in public, mm-hmm. do all these things, I want to get paid for it. Yeah. Like it was just refreshing to hear someone actually be honest about it. I mean, I'm not saying everyone should be, nor is everybody like that, but he was just so honest about it. And also just little tidbits that he sort of said that all his band members, like everything gets split evenly. Yep. Just because he's the face and people want to book him doesn't necessarily mean that everyone isn't a valid contributing piece of the puzzle, I suppose. So, yeah, just... Full respecter and all, all the stuff to do with the Cancer Council, all that stuff is just obviously I liked him for a reason and I've just extracted even more reasons to keep liking him. Firstly, thank you so much to Danny Fagan. Get around him. But I want to get around you, Josh, and hear about your how your goal is going quickly. My, my weight loss goal? Yeah. I feel great. Good. I feel better every day. Good. I'm not having any afternoon crashes like I was a month ago where I get real cranky and tired in the yeah. afternoon. So, you know, I mean, it's all it's all coming up, Josh. You know how I fix that? How do you fix that? Just by having a coffee. <laughs> Coffees are good. Coffees are great. I haven't given those up, by the way, guys, if yeah, you're listening. Just okay. <laughs> flick us a coffee. Not on this welcome to weight loss business. I can crash in the afternoon. That's fine. <laughs> Give me, hit me up with the caffeine, please. We got three off a Sarah. So yeah. thank you, Sarah, if you're listening. And thank you for the lovely comment about listening to some of the back catalogue. Yeah, That means nice. a lot to us. So punchingsideways.com in the buy me a coffee button. Yeah, do that. Yeah, do that might that. be easiest. And I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Laters.